Kia ora koutou, nga mihi kia koutou. Welcome to this final webisode of the Our Regenerative Future series, produced by Pure Advantage and Edmund Hillary Fellowship. It's wonderful here to have you here this evening. I'm Alina Siegfried, I'm the author and host of this series. And in this, the 12th episode, uh, over the next 90 minutes, we'll be exploring the opportunities for a regenerative economy for Aotearoa New Zealand with four very special guests, each of them uh, previous panelists in this series. So Dame Anne Salmond is an anthropologist and historian best known for her writings on New Zealand history, her study of Maori culture, and her efforts to improve intercultural understanding. She was named the Kiwi Bank New Zealander of the Year in 2013 as the Royal Society of New Zealand Rutherford Medal and as a distinguished professor at, AU, at the AUT, or is it, I think University of Auckland, apologies. Um, Hamish Bielski, along with his wife Amy and their three children, farm in a joint venture in 300 hectares in South Otago. Amidst gentle rolling hills and steeper gullies that bound the Pomahaka River, they have been traveling the path of using regenerative farming principles for several years now. Um, running 2,500 breeding sheep and 200 trading cattle. Um, using well-planned high-density mob grazing has allowed them to increase the pasture growth as well as higher stocking rates and profits for the farm, which is fantastic to hear. Mike Taitoko is the co-founder of Toha, an investment platform being set up to fund frontline action to solve climate, environmental and biodiversity challenges. He recently launched Toha's first impact venture, Calm the Farm, which supports the scale transition towards regenerative agriculture in Aotearoa. Mike is a leading advisor in Māori and Indigenous economic development and is the co-founder and CEO of Takewa, an award-winning data visualization and analytics company. And finally, we have Rod Oram, a business journalist who contributes weekly to Newsroom, Nine to Noon and News Talk ZB. He is a public speaker on deep sustainability, business, economics, and innovation. Rod is a member of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, uh, as is Mike as well, which brings together people from here and abroad who seek to contribute to global change from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I think we'll just quickly look at the poll results. Um, it looks like we have got, most people have voted now, um, and we've got, 36% of you this evening from the primary sector um, with a few other people from areas of tourism, other business. We've got a few council or government um, reps here this evening and academia as well. Um, it looks like we have got uh, most people at least a little bit familiar with the Our Regenerative Future content series and Got an almost even split between rural and urban this evening. Um, a few more from urban, which is fantastic that there's that level of interest in, in regenerative agriculture and a regenerative uh, economy from uh, our urban dwellers as well. And um, kia ora to the 14% of you this evening who are calling in from outside New Zealand. Fantastic to have you along. Now, before we dive into discussion with our panel this evening, um, I wanted to take just a few minutes to outline um, what we've covered so far in the Our Regenerative Future series. I began work, uh, work researching this series back in December last year, and the idea was to develop a content series funded by Pure Advantage and Edmund Hillary Fellowship to bring to light some of the stories of those that were working at the front line of regenerative agriculture uh, in New Zealand. Um, Pure Advantage had been looking at soil carbon through the lens of regenerative agriculture and some of the EHS fellows were already involved in, um, in various ways. So I originally interviewed um, Quorum Sense co-founder John O'Fru and found it quite fitting that at the time when we first spoke, he was actually navigating a long detour around closed roads in South Canterbury uh, due to the extensive flooding that happened um, late last year down in the South Island. And that sparked off a discussion around farm resilience and, uh, and the soil moisture holding capacity with regenerative te techniques. Um, threads of conversation connected one expert from another in the field, and uh, we ended up with an initial 15-part content series that we launched mid-May um, off the back of the COVID-19 lockdown which was an interesting time to be um, 
really bringing to light some of these conversations. Um, we had launched an initial six webinars. Um, and then as interest grew, we added another six, culminating in this, our season finale. We first looked at trends in international food markets with organic yogurt entrepreneur Gary Hirschberg, who outlined the big opportunity for New Zealand to capitalise on con changing consumer behaviours towards organics in the US uh, with premium products. And American suppliers unable to actually keep up with demand at the moment. That's how quickly it's growing. Later in the series, that was reiterated by uh, Jeff Chick from the Rodale Institute, a global leader on regenerative agriculture, and American organics expert Robin O'Brien, who has been called the Erin Brockovich of food, which I think is a pretty, pretty neat title to have. We also discussed what international food trends might look like in post-pandemic New Zealand and, and the world as people begin to realize, I guess, how intricately intertwined we humans are with the natural world. Um, we've talked in depth with those who have got their hands in the soil here in Aotearoa, including one of tonight's guests, Hamish Bielski, and exploring what regenerative agriculture looks like at the moment across sheep and beef, dairy, mixed cropping and horticulture. Um, we've learned that regardless of the type of farming, many of the same principles of regenerative agriculture apply, such as observing and responding to what's going on around the farm and then learning to trust your intuition alongside the data that's coming from it. We got deep into soil science with Quorum Sense and Manaki Fenua's Dr. Gwen Grillet, along with internationally renowned soil expert, Nicole Masters, and talked a lot about plant diversity, soil biology and mycorrhizal fungi, and the key roles that each of those play in building a resilient soil ecosystem that reduces, or in some cases, even can eliminate the need for synthetic chemical fertilizers, pesticides, and insecticides. Nicole and several others also shared their insights from around the world, what's happening in the space, and with some important uh, lessons for New Zealand. And against the backdrop of this summer's past drought in the Hawke's Bay and uh, much of the rest of the North Island, um, we explored how the deeper root structures more diverse pastures and thriving soils that are typical of regenerative agriculture can help make farms more resilient to both droughts and floods, um, both of which I think we're going to see more of in the coming decades. We talked with John O'Frew and Sam Lang about how the concept of regeneration actually extends beyond the ecological aspects into the social fabric of our rural communities. Um, hearing firsthand some stories of how a switch to regenerative agriculture has improved mental health for many farmers, which is a big issue for rural New Zealand. And farmers reporting that it's brought back the joy into farming for them again. We peel back the layers of this conversation a bit further to find that regeneration of our natural living systems and communities is going to take more than just farmers and that it's both ur urban and rural dwelling Kiwis who have a role to play in this, um, such as the scope of this mahi. Uh, we shine a light to what's going on in our cities with the fast growing urban agriculture movement and circular systems approach that folks are taking towards waste reduction, sustainable transport and community sustainable, uh, community supported agriculture, all in the same model. We spoke with several in the Regenerate Now network who are doing amazing work all over the country. Took a deep dive into forestry with Dame Ann Salmon who returns this evening, Dr. David Hall and Scion's Ramona Radford, um, questioning the strategy of widespread plantation forestry uh, for the purpose of clear felling. And we looked at the integrated role that native forests can play in restoring our ecosystems and the somewhat perverse incentives that we have in our current emissions trading scheme for farmers to plant their land in pine trees. And in this post COVID world, which sees much of our tourism industry suffering greatly at the moment, we explored what a future of regenerative tourism might look like. And that panel included uh, Dr. Suzanne Beckin from Griffith University, an advisor to uh, DOC, and who had a fantastic article also published last week by Pure Advantage for Newsroom, um, along with Larissa Cooney, who outlined tourism beautifully from a standpoint of developing relationships with place 
and a focus on bringing more matauranga Māori into how we design our tourism experiences. Now, throughout all these conversations, the strongest thread underpinning everything is that building a regenerative economy is going to take a really widespread change in our mindset. And it's a change that sees us questioning every part of the integrated systems we live within, both the natural and the anthropogenic, and committing to replacing extractive press processes and practices with ones that regenerate, restore, and embed resilience into the ways that they can function. <coughs> Excuse me. One challenge that's come up time and again is that the idea of New Zealand's agriculture system is already regenerative. Now, in some places, there are, I think there is <coughs> some truth to this claim. We do have a comparative advantage on much of the world already with continual pasture cover and so on, and a temperate climate. But for the purpose of this series is to show that there is still room for improvement. And a huge opportunity for New Zealand is, and the nation as a whole. So as we close out this series, which has been recorded and is freely available to access, my hope is that New Zealanders can begin to see the opportunities there are in regenerative agriculture and regenerative principles in general. Uh, particularly for our primary industries. The producers, contributors and panellists for our regenerative future are calling for a mindset shift. One that embraces openness and continuous improvement. One that listens carefully and does better with nature and one that imagines New Zealand as a world leading model that is collaborative, restorative and regenerative using systems level thinking to address the complex challenges of the 21st century. That is my vision for Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, <clears throat> and I think with that, we're going to get into some questions uh, for the panel. Would love to start with you, Mike. Um, when we're talking about these systems of regeneration, there are many crossovers with Matauranga Māori and, and Te Ao Māori. And perhaps you could speak um, to begin with how Māori worldviews can inform and guide our transition towards a regenerative economy. Over to you. Uh, kia ora, Lena. Ngā mihi nui kia koutou ko Mike Tai Tōku Taku Ngo no Mani o Koutou Ahau. I uh, just want to acknowledge the uh, panel. I feel really privileged to be part of this panel. Rod Hamish and Damien, uh, kia ora koutou katoa. Um, Mātauranga, I mean, this is a huge question to get started with, Alina. Um, I think there's no doubt that from a Mātauranga Māori perspective, if we uh, let me step back a little bit. The world that I grew up in was dominated heavily by our democratic Westminster governance democratic system, by our kind of uh, capitalist industrial system. My dad had a, an engineering business. We grew up in commerce. We knew what that, we, we got used to what that um, kind of world was like. And today, right now, a lot of our policy and decision is driven heavily by a reductive scientific uh, Western scientific uh, model of um, how we work stuff out, reduce it down to the nth degree so we can understand each of the moving parts and then maybe we can put it back together again so all those parts equal one. Now, working with a lot of Māori groups and science, Western science and organisations for a number of years now, I get to see why Māori get confused when we get down to a highly reductive conversation around um, trying to understand something. It's hard for us to unpack uh, each of the moving parts and see them for themselves when we um, deeply feel internally that the relationship and interrelationship between all the moving parts are critical to understand what those look like and how it feels. And so from a Mataranga Māori perspective, uh, if you think about that from an agricultural standpoint, the kind of monocultural uh, industrialised agricultural system that dominates New Zealand and, and globally right now is aligns perfectly and neatly with that kind of Westminster and capitalist and industrial and individualistic kind of way, reductive way of seeing the world. It doesn't align so neatly with a more holistic worldview of the relationship between uh, Ranginui and Papatuanuku, Mother Earth and uh, Father Sky, and uh, how we understand everything in between and how we relate. We come from all of those things. We come from the soil. We go back to the soil. Uh, we can't reduce them down to an nth degree in order to understand them because un true understanding comes from understanding the relationships across this space. 
So I think there's huge overlaps from a uh, te ao Māori and Mataranga Māori perspective and with regenerative agriculture and regenerative economies. However, I think it's really for Māori and iwi themselves to determine what leadership looks like in this space as we decide for ourselves what, how our own worldview is going to inform our farming practices, how our own worldview is going to inform our economic development, our community development, our whānau development. And we run the risk of trying to assimilate a Māori worldview into a Western worldview of governance of agriculture, whatever that looks like, when at the same time we're trying to decolonise ourselves from being assimilated into a Western worldview to try and understand how life works. I'm kind of, it's a big, this is a massive question, so excuse my kind of flowery narrative around this, but I think it's important. Uh, I'll, I'll finish by saying, if you look at what uh, Hewaka Ekenoa, what the uh, Primary Sector Joint Action Plan is looking like, what the um, Primary Sector Council has come out with, with Taiao being right in the middle of the strategy, I think that's that's absolutely awesome. Māori values and principles sitting right at the heart of cross-industry, of pan-industry and government initiatives in order to think about how we drive into the future. The challenge, however, based on what I've just said, is going to be how do we work through these strategies not trying to for someone else to try and be the other, but for someone else to understand the other. Because we don't want, if you're going to put Taiao in the middle and Kaitiakitanga and our roles as guardian and stewards of the land and water and the whenua, or whatever we want to have, we want to frame it. We need to do that on a much deeper appreciation and understanding of that we all think about this differently. Our worldviews aren't the same, and it's okay to do that. And don't try and make your view wrong and mine right and saying, how do we move forward? I think Mātauranga Māori, if we're going to do this and lead it out uh, around the agriculture and economy, uh, will do so in a way that is inclusive, that is thinks about the e that ecological systems, that thinks about our community, that thinks about whānau first. When we think about selling produce, produce offshore into the future, we need to make sure our whānau and communities are the first ones who are being fed. And so I think from a regenerative, and, and, and because a lot of our Māori uh, prime industry groups have been assimilated into the kind of industrial process, there's still a little bit of unwinding to do as well from a practical perspective to get Māori businesses to start feeling okay to operate in a world that reflects their values and not someone else's. And so we're seeing it in businesses right now that are exporting and doing some amazing stuff with whānau and community development. Uh, the return on investment um, spans across not just the financial return, but the return on health and well-being and prosperity for their own families first. So it's a massive question. I could go on for about a, a week on this kaupapa and never, ever get to the end of it. So I hope I haven't confused everybody straight out the gate. Kia ora. Kia ora, Mike. Thank you. And it is wonderful indeed to see um, some of the some of government sectors uh, really starting to take a bit of notice of regenerative agriculture and, and, um, and it being mentioned um, quite a lot throughout that Primary Sector Council report, the Fit for the Better World report, if anybody wants to check that out. Um, now this conversation is um, about um, a regenerative economy for New Zealand, but Hamish, I'd love to start um, with regenerative agriculture because that's where we started with this series. Um, and what it looks like in New Zealand. So can you briefly just um, share for us where, where you see the sector is at and what, what sort of shifts have been taking place over the last few years or indeed just even over the last few months? Just need to unmute yourself there. Um, over the last few months, uh, it, it's... The exponential growth is huge. I, I, I'm, I can't really believe my eyes after a lot of negative press earlier on in the year, or even still now, but I think, you know, we've had John O'Fru and Peter Barrett going through the whole country, and they probably talked to near on a thousand farmers. We've had probably three or four um, events held in the last month, and one in Kaikoura, Gore, we've got another one this week in the Taranaki, um, and others, which there's another 500 farmers there. Uh, the interest, interest is genuine. Uh, it's a, exceptionally exciting to see um, the, the genuine want for understanding of um, how to improve our farming systems, our, how, how to improve our land and our whole ecosystems. Farmers are really getting the message from you know, our, the people of New Zealand. Um, and I think also 
when we look at our customers around the world, the demand for um, produce growing that actually improves our environment is such a strong message that we ignore that at our peril. And I just have no qualms about the future direction of agriculture. It's just up to each individual how fast they want to get on board in the sense of being honest with themselves about where they're at with their practices. Um, ask those questions, is what I'm doing truly sustainable? And by the term sustainable, I mean not exhausting natural resources on our farms or throughout the world, i.e. soil, um, fertilizers, etc. And Am I putting sediment into the water wise? Am I leaching unnecessary amount of nutrients? So I think a whole lot more farmers are now genuinely asking those questions and we're all just learning daily, weekly about um, some of those solutions um, to, to our challenges. So it's, um, it's, just, it's just wonderful. Mm, it's fantastic to hear that more people are coming along on the train. Um, Damien, you travel around the country a fair bit, uh, speaking with people across the primary sector in particular. Um, how do you see regenerative concepts interweaving through um, our primary sector, through agriculture, forestry, urban settings, tourism, and, and what trends are you noticing? Well, I would add horticulture, viticulture, um, you know, as you say, the urban settings. What I'm seeing on the ground, I think the closer people are to, to the ground um, in Aotearoa at the moment, um, those that love our islands, but also those that actually work with the land, um, the more, the closer they are, the more they're seeing that things like COVID-19, for example, didn't come from nowhere. It came out of the destruction of habitats and kind of putting wild animals and people too close together so that viruses can jump the species barrier and they're understanding about climate change and they're seeing it in their own, you know, in their own landscapes and in their own productive practices. And so what I'm seeing is a huge willingness to innovate, um, to embrace these ideas, but also to try and do things with them that um, in a small intimate society you can do in a way that's much harder and some of the bigger, more sort of, if you like, um, encrusted societies around the world where uh, lots of practices are so embedded that they're very difficult to shift. In New Zealand, we can, I think, be quite agile. And we have been in the past. And so people are understanding that it's urgent, that, that climate change, but not that, just that, the, you know, the extinction crisis, what's happening to our oceans, because we are people that love our land and our, our oceans and our beaches, we're kind of close enough to see it. And especially young people, you know, when you, when you talk with younger farmers, younger horticulturalists, viticulturalists, um, but not just them. You know, for them at the moment, they want a future that's full of hope and joy. They don't want one that's looming apocalypse, you know, uh, and they're getting very impatient with the uh, decision makers down in Wellington and in local government who just don't seem to be shifting as fast as things are happening on the ground. So I think there needs to be a lot of listening to people who are close to the land in all sorts of different ways. And that includes people in tourism as well. And they're noticing shifts and they're seeing they're real and they're very impatient for smart practical action to start happening. And some of that's been held up not by their own um, desires, but because there are people that are stuck in policies that, um, They've promulgated and they're now finding that maybe they're counterproductive, uh, but because of political imperatives, they don't really want to shift in too much of a hurry. So I'm seeing something that's really exciting in Aotearoa. Uh, and I think Mike, just to respond to what Mike was saying, I think kaitiaki tanga, these Māori concepts, taio, they're a big part of it, but they only work because there are ideas a bit like that in the West as well. If you think of the old web of life idea, or you look what's happening in the sciences with, with complexity theory and ideas of, you know, ecology and symbiosis and the biological sciences and so on. These aren't, you know, there's a resonance. They're not the same, uh, but 
it makes it possible for all sorts of Kiwis uh, to listen to ideas of tai o, a river that's, you know, if I'm the river and the river is me, and lots of people say, mm, yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. And, and they get it partly from their own heritage as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think what we're seeing is, is um, Western modalities of thought catching up a little bit to some of these uh, indigenous concepts that have been around for so many generations. And that's, that's really welcome to see here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, that, that word regeneration uh, does seem to still spook a few people, um, it, both in politics and, and outside as well. Um, we've had, you know, initially in this series, uh, a little bit of pushback to this idea that, that farmers aren't regenerative already in New Zealand. Um, Rod, when we're talking about economy, can you explain what sort of economic shifts we're talking about and, uh, when we say regenerative economy? And what, what are the opportunities, if not even advantages uh, for business New Zealand, businesses in New Zealand to take that sort of approach? Um, it's a very profound shift across um, all of our economic activity because it's about us learning how to make sure everything we do works with nature and not against it. Um, and uh, of course, nature is our life support system. And uh, we humans have, have substantially impaired that life support system, particularly in the last 50 years, uh, and more, more particularly in the well, last 70 years from about 1950. This is called the Great Acceleration, where we've got this um, enormous acceleration in economic activity and energy use and land use and all the rest, which then have impacts on um, Earth systems. Uh, that's the whole planetary boundaries work of um, Johann Rockström and others. So I think regeneration is an unsettling concept for um, some people because it implies criticism about uh, what we're doing is wrong or damaging. Well, of course, it's more complicated than that because we have a spectrum. We've got uh, things that we do which are sustainable at one end of the spectrum and things that aren't. Um, but I would argue even at the sustainable end of the spectrum, it still doesn't embrace the concept of how much we've lost um, in terms of um, the, the richness and the resilience of our ecosystems. So, for example, here in New Zealand, we were the last uh, large landmass that humans settled, and that was um, uh, uh, the first Māori to arrive about 800 years ago or so. Um, and um, we've also been um, the place where we've degenerated um, those uh, natural systems fastest overall. Um, and um, so the opportunity for, understand, for us to understand how rich and resilient those, uh, those ecosystems are, um, and that we can play a part um, in um, taking the pressure off those ecosystems by using those ecosystems um, in more integrated ways. Um, and so those ecosystems have a chance to, to regrow, to, to regenerate. Um, and for me, that's um, not only an opportunity, but a tremendous advantage for us in New Zealand, because um, of all the uh, developed countries in the world, we are most dependent on our um, uh, on that huge natural abundance um, for uh, our identity of self, for example, um, even though we're a more in, um, uh, urbanized population than the French or the Germans, um, even those urban of us in New Zealand still very much identify ourselves um, by this place and by this land and by its waters. Um, and um, um, the other aspect of this is that some of our competitors overseas on food, for example, um, are um, uh, moving towards technologies that can get to zero environmental impact. So growing meat from stem cells, for example, or growing things uh, aeroponically in an enclosed building. But if we get our, our farming systems and our land use systems right, we, we don't just get to zero environmental impact, we actually get to positive uh, environmental impact where that regeneration really starts to kick in. And of course, this isn't just about how we grow food or use land in rural New Zealand. Um, I think it's terribly important for us to consider across the whole economy how important um, those ecosystems are. Of course, it's been very important for tourism and hopefully at some point that's going to come back. Um, but it's important for um, attracting people here to be students um, or to be immigrants here or our film industry. 
but even I think more profoundly, um, many of our economic activities that seem to be um, purely intellectual uh, or, or really seem to be completely divorced from those living systems are actually deep down rather in, informed and enlivened by those systems. So that's why this re giving those life systems a chance to regenerate themselves by using them in these sorts of uh, regenerative ways. Um, I think is absolutely the right thing to do, but an absolutely fabulous um, advantage for us um, um, out in the world. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And um, I mean, you, you, you talked a little bit there about, about the need for, for action beyond the policy, and I'd love to get some um, tangible examples in a minute, but Rod, do you, what, what policies do you see that we, we need or that are really missing to embed a culture of regeneration into um, our primary industries. I know we've heard a little bit about the fit for a better world strategy, which is a good start. Um, can you speak to any other policies that might be helpful? Um, well, we've certainly got at the very highest level um, the right policies in terms of a Zero Carbon Act, um, because that's um, now uh, um, focusing our minds on, on that trajectory we need to be on to a very low um, um, uh, carbon emissions economy uh, across the whole economy. But uh, what's uh, yet to come um, are um, the next uh, levels down in that, um, particularly as we start to think about sectors. So how we decarbonize the transport sector, for example, um, uh, or how we encourage um, different farming systems. And I'm very excited by what um, Hewoka um, Inoa is up to, um, because um, uh, uh, whilst I was a little skeptical about how effective that might be, um, from what I've seen of the work so far, there is a, a real sense of a journey here and an exciting one about um, how we do um, measure more on farm and, and make sure that what we're doing is uh, reducing the negative things, um, but increasing the positive things. Uh, specifically, that's around um, carbon emissions. And, um, but we've still got a very good long way to go. We're still being quite random in, in zooming over here to do this and over here to do that. And you can see it in the um, COVID recovery investments. Um, um, there are um, plans like $1.1 billion for um, um, digging up wilding pines and for restoring rivers and all sorts of other things. But those are just dealing with the damage with, that we've done. Um, they're not in investing in the better systems to prevent us doing that damage in the future. So, so that's why there is still a long way to go. Um, and um, the key, key organisation in this is absolutely the Climate Change Commission, um, because that's going to be now um, taking that Zero Carbon Act um, and um, making sure that because we have these stepping down budgets on our emissions, that it will be evaluating all of our policies from government and all our responses in society um, on that journey. And um, it's, a, it's an impressive pe bunch of people who have been appointed commissioners. And uh, we've seen, for example, in the UK over the last 11 years, um, how effective that sort of organization is. And I think the chance to do that in a very New Zealand way, particularly increasingly informed by to our Māori, that Māori worldview, which is turning up not just in the primary sector, but it's fundamental to the 11, each of the 11 national science challenges. Um, and even the Reserve Bank um, now is able to talk about monetary policy in those terms. If you haven't checked out the Reserve Bank's to our Māori view of the world, it's worth checking out. So um, uh, we're on a very distinctive journey here, which is in hugely um, in, informed and enlivened um, by um, that Māori worldview and Mathauranga Māori. Yes, you make a very good point there around us treating the symptoms and being the, the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff for a lot of the, the effects that we've see, been seeing. Um, I'd like to put to you, Hamish, um, a question. And just to remind people on the, on the webinar this evening that you can submit your questions into the Q&A box for the panel, and we'll get to some of those later in the call. Um, but Hamish, um, what, what do you see as some of the practical low-hanging fruits? What, what are the levers that we can readily pull in our primary sectors to be more regenerative? Um, what, yeah, what are, you, what are you seeing? And what's what your advice for people right off the bat? 
Um, like, like what, what Rod said there, is that we're fighting fires, not implementing solutions. And so you've got regenerative agriculture, forestry, tourism, are, are all one. You know, like we have 10 hectares of gullies here that we would love to have planted out tomorrow. But in our transition to implementing regenerative management, we need to put that money into the, um, the risk of change, but also the infrastructure, the fencing and the water systems to allow us to improve our grazing management. In the meantime, we have um, tourism, which uh, entails a lot of flying. Now, flying in itself is completely unsustainable, so let's not delude ourselves there. However, if they want to help, genuinely help New Zealand land and people, invest in f farms throughout New Zealand, which is thousands upon thousands of unproductive land, and plant diverse forests, which increase biodiversity, improve water quality, and improve soils, um, all of which pine trees do not do. So th this opportunity for big companies to not just offset, but actually improve and restore um, our landscapes, then is such a huge draw for our tourism. So the, the combinations of all of them working together is so blatantly obvious and the advantage is so big, I can't understand why this hasn't been put together by politicians. I guess, or in policy makers, I guess it's just too hard and it's far easier just to sit down and do some simple accounting and then just plant some trees that will solve a problem for 30 years and then we're back to square one. The amount of land that could go into diverse plantings is going to take us 20 to 30 years of planting, but we'll just carry on for hundreds of years. It seems so obvious it's crazy but anyway i mean I'm, I'm very encouraged and hopefully when you've got people like the panelists we have now to help encourage policymakers to really step in and step up um the people of new zealand would be so far behind that strategy um any political party that implements it you know they could be in power for three or four terms <laughs> <laughs> I do like that idea. Um, you, you speak a little bit there um, about about the the forests that we're planting and the nature of those sorts of trees. Um, Damien, we had a li lively conversation a, a couple of weeks ago around regenerative forestry. Um, can you briefly outline how the forestry sector, in your view, can become more regenerative and, and some of those opportunities that Hamish talked about to take a much more integrated approach towards forestry, combining it with, with agriculture, tourism, viticulture, horticulture, and, and also community revitalization. I think the critical thing is that in tackling one you know, great existential crisis, which is climate change, we don't create others. Um, and we don't make things like, for example, the biodiversity crisis even worse. And when we're thinking about how to sequester carbon, um, you know, Trees are absolutely a, a great way of helping to sequester carbon, but the key thing is to make sure that it's working in with everything else that we're trying to do, restore our rivers, you know, have prosperous, thriving rural landscapes, um, livelihoods for people on the land and in rural communities that are, you know, functioning really well, um, looking after tourism as well, and to blanket landscapes sort of irrespective of of their soil qualities, their topography, and all these kind of things in vast swathes of monocultures of conifers. Um, in other parts of the world, people are not doing that. They're moving away from that because climate change is bringing increased risk of fire, increased risk of pests. You know, big conifer forests are burning um, in many parts of the world, Northern Europe, for example, at the moment. And that makes climate change even worse. And industrial forestry also emits a lot of carbon in the process of doing it. Whereas if we had the sort of um, 
mixed land use model. We, we stop thinking of everything in some sort of, you know, like these industrial forests are like balance sheets laid across the land. You know, the trees are all planted in grids. They're shallow rooting. They're all the same. Uh, there's, the biodiversity obviously is not great. Um, and the environmental qualities we all know about. We've seen what happens when they're clear fell harvested. It's, it's appalling what's going on in places like Tolaga Bay. What we could do instead is what Hamish is talking about. And my experience of farm forestry is that farmers actually, because they're there, they look after the forests in a way that doesn't happen with the big investors. Um, and increasingly, if we do carbon forestry, it's gonna be lock up and leave. And those forests will be full of weeds, they'll be full of pests, they don't create any jobs. We'll have you know, kind of landscapes that are barren on a number of fronts, including uh, the social um, front. And this is where regenerative approaches, the sort of nature-based forestry that you can see in, in countries like Germany and Switzerland and many other parts of the world today, mixed forests, mixed age, mixed varieties, locally, um, closely adapted to local habitats. Um, they don't use, they avoid spraying, they use, they harvest in small coops so the canopy remains intact. Uh, they're open in many cases by law to the public, so this leisure goes along with it as well. This is a humane, you know, this is such a wonderful um, model. And farmers, my experience, we're doing a big rivers restoration project at the moment. Every farmer in the catchment's on board. The young farmers are just so keen to figure out how they can, as Hamish said, if only they could earn a bit of income from those gullies and those riparian margins, uh, because they are creating benefits for the public, for the wider public, uh, with that land use. Something like a biodiversity credit, for example, mixed up to with, you know, combined with uh, nature-based forestry. Again, I think, it, like Hamish, I think it's a complete no-brainer. And what we're doing at the moment is like brainless. Uh, some, we're creating ecological, potentially ecological catastrophe and trying to solve climate change. And, um, you know, we just need to be real and listen to the people on the land. Go and have a good look at what's actually going on after a highly erodible landscapes are clear felled and harvested. And just stop it. You know, stop wrecking our beautiful country with, with solutions that don't work in, in practice. And come up with something cleverer and more, you know, something which draws on our love um, of the bush, for example. And it's, it makes it a pleasure and a joy. Uh, you know, the, the restoration project we're involved with, both the river one, but also the landscapes, the birds come back. We've got kids running all through the place. You know, people just, there's a smile on people's faces when they walk into that kind of a landscape and that kind of a farm. And we could do it in New Zealand. I think we could. I love it. Just stop it. Just stop it, New Zealand. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you touched on a really interesting point there about some sort of a biodiversity credit. Um, can you talk us through briefly how you would see um, such a, a credit um, being played out in New Zealand? Well, I can partly pass that one over to Mike as well, because he's very involved in one of the initiatives that's going on in this space. But essentially what goes on in the emissions trading scheme is that at the moment, because we have a, we have a, a history of almost a century now of planting pine plantations. And, um, and so nearly all of our foresters, nearly all of our forest scientists are used to that kind of forestry. And that's the way they think about forestry. Um, and that's the way it sort of goes. And um, so the ETS has been set up. And when people think trees, I mean, even looking, uh, dare I say it, at the Greens forestry policy, on the front page is a whole picture of pine forests which is kind of amazing when you, when you reflect on that. Um, because people just, you know, they think somehow or other any tree is a good tree. But for us, it's the right tree in the right place. Um, making sure that you're thinking about the rivers, you're thinking about protecting the fertile soils, you're thinking about rural communities and the future for young people on the land. You know, you're thinking about the birds, you're thinking about the waterways, you're thinking about the ocean. You're doing this interconnected thinking and you're giving it a financial reward. And the idea of a biodiversity credit is that, is instead of giving people on the East Coast where I'm from, 10 times more to plant pine trees on the most, some of the most erodible landscapes in the world, uh, and then you give them for 
uh, regenerating native forest. I mean, it's crazy what we're doing you put them on an equal footing financially and find mechanisms for doing that. But maybe Mike can talk more about that. Um, kia ora, Damien. Um, look, I think um, 100% agree with everything that Damien has just said and, and Hamish and Rod too. Um, uh, I see questions come up on the, um, on the chat uh, from Naomi asking about in New Zealand, do their team retreats planting re restoration natives on a farm? Um, they're, they're a good example, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it's a really good observation. Um, so yeah, getting your staff out to plant native trees, indigenous trees on farms is a good idea. But against, in the latest, last thing I heard against some good advice around New Zealand needing to divert some of their offsetting credits into uh, a more biodiverse uh, strategy as far as uh, the latest, last thing I heard, and, and I may be wrong here, but that, that we're still being pointed largely towards uh, pine forest, planting pine trees uh, and making the most, the, the, the companies are still gonna try and make the most of the ETS framework that exists. And if you look at the lookup tables that the government sets out, i.e. if you wanna get some carbon credits on, through planting these trees somewhere, then the best thing you can do is plant pine trees in Gisborne because the lookup tables tell you that that's where you're gonna get rewarded the most handsomely. And so firstly, we've got, we've got a couple of problems there. Firstly is the science that's driven the lookup tables has come out of you know, what, what I was saying earlier, that reductive scientific view on uh, what do we understand right now about carbon sequestration when we think about it through uh, money-making industrialized kind of lens. And it's pretty easy to come up with uh, some science and, and maths that point us to planting pine trees is the best thing to do. Some research just came out recently and said, well, actually the carbon sequestering opportunities through planting indigenous forests, because of all the biodiversity and activity that happens under those canopies, um, sequesters um, a huge amount more carbon than what we do, what we're seeing out of our pine plantations. So when we're getting into these kind of debates and arguments about what sequesters more plant pine trees or um, or, or indigenous forests, the, the question is actually, there's a, well, there's a wider question is actually how are we thinking about this through a uh, much more diverse and therefore biodiversity kind of lens. What are all the things we need to be thinking about in nature if we're going to really start to turn around the hydrological cycles, the carbon cycle, the you know all of these things that are kind of really you know we've and as Rod said earlier, humans we've impacted on these cycles so severely and dramatically that you know this extinction that's coming is now look, looking like it's real it's not when it's if uh, and so uh, while we're here and what time we have left what are we going to do to acknowledge that this whole biodiversity play is po quite possibly one of the most important plays that we could make uh, and so the biodiversity credit offers us a way to say well what's a, if money is still the primary driver and i think it is uh, based on the investors and people that we've been engaged with globally in this space. At the end of the day, the re financial return on investment is still the number one thing that's driving these investors. You can talk about ESG and SDGs and all the DGs in the world. From a, a general global investment standpoint, if you can't make money out of it at, at, at X percent, then we're not interested, right? We'll go and find something else to claim our ESG um, kind of brownie points against. And so, again, this is where biodiversity credits open up whole new opportunities for us to um, leverage the offsetting, the investment that firms or investors want to make <clears throat> into areas that are going to help us regenerate, going to help us get carbon in, going to help us hold water in the ground rather than getting washed off and with nutrients and soils into our rivers. It's going to allow us to have estuaries and waterways and harbours and oceans that are starting to work kind of in you know symbiotically with how nature works as best as it can without us getting in the way so how do we not get in the way well we don't get in the way by continuing to follow down this kind of top-down cumbersome investment model that we've all bought into and we kind of get in the way we don't get in the way by getting in the way uh, by bringing in new types of funding and investment mechanisms like the biodiversity credits, like soil carbon credits, uh, like water bonds and the types of markets that we need now from a financial standpoint that are going to encourage better practices and better behaviours. We kind of hope that um, 
humans are waking up and investors are waking up and wanting to see you know, global at scale, wanting to see their money being put to work uh, to make a difference now that climate you know we're seeing it in new zealand right now our you know our biggest um drought in many years turned to a 500 year flood within weeks uh, and the devastation is insane i don't know why we call it 500 year floods you know these are annual things now um but unfortunately our investment kind of uh global investment landscape still dominates around financial roi and so we've got to find ways to be much more innovative around that we'll give you the return on investment but at the same time, we have to prove that that return on investment is impactful in areas of biodiversity, in areas of carbon sequestration, in areas of cleaning water up. Pollyanna view says, well, you know, we can show right now, we're doing, my guys right now can show what cleaner water looks like as a consequence of regenerative agriculture. They can show what healthier food systems look like right now as a consequence of regenerative agriculture and regenerative organics. They can show what increased carbon sequestration looks like in healthier animals and healthier humans as a result of regenerative organics, right? And the investors go, that's cool, but we want to know what our financial return on investment is going to be if we put our money in. And so that's not all the investors, but that's probably 99% of the global investor landscape that we're engaged with. So thankfully, there's some solutions coming, as Dan mentioned, like the biodiversity credits. Right now, there's some guys up in the US that are, have a, a, a lofty goal of raising $100 billion to put to work towards a large-scale transition towards regenerative agriculture. The, uh, it's, a, it's a massive goal, but the quality of the people that we've seen involved in the early stages of this fund, um, I, I absolutely have no doubt that they can pull it off. Uh, so that kind of runs counter to what I was saying about these in investors only want to see what the financial ROI is. We're seeing, we are seeing more and more wanting to see how they make money, but how they make it in a way that, and Robin O'Brien, who I just think does some of the most amazing work on the face of the earth, and you mentioned her earlier, Elena, and she was on an early uh, webinar, um, you know, replant capital and what they're doing. Yeah, people need to start taking notice. There's vehicles now that can meet the needs of investors and at the same time uh, provide evidence to policymakers, to communities, to industry, that that money is not just making a financial return, but it's having a positive impact on environment, climate outcomes as well. Mm, and there is, it is uh, heartening to see some, some larger companies overseas looking to this um, regenerative agriculture as a solution. We've got um, Patagonia made an announcement last year, um, Danone, um, and also General Mills committing on some level um, to sourcing a lot more of their of their ingredients and um, raw materials from regeneratively produced um, origins. Um, so there's a good question here from Jen in the Q and A um, panel um, that doing regenerative business is is one side of of the argument of a regenerative economy. Um, but Rod, do you have anything to say about changing the way that we do economics in general to make it more regenerative by nature? Big question. Uh, it's a great question. And um, indeed, um, economics is, um, is very uh, broken, uh, as indeed is capitalism. And um, the problem with economics and capitalism is they are uh, very much um, swamped and driven by just the financial aspect of things. Um, so uh, we're being dominated by financial capitalism, if you like. But it's much more helpful to think of uh, all the other capitals, of which the most important is natural capital, uh, i.e. Um, those living systems themselves. But then human capital, which is um, the skills and resources of individuals, but crucially social capital, in, in other words, um, are the resources of us collectively as we work together. And then the um, intellectual, technical, um, and other kind of science capital. Then if you think about all of those capitals working together, whereas uh, financial capital is only a facilitator of all of that, it's not you know, by, by any means the dominant one, you then get um, a, a much better balance in what's going on here. Um, there are all sorts of um, uh, ways in which economics is changing. So um, we have a, a very rich field developing in ecological economics, for example, and we've got some terrific um, exponents of that here in New Zealand. 
Um, but in terms of um, a single person who I think is um, most um, effective at describing how economics needs to change, uh, my absolute favorite is Kate Raworth, um, the British economist. Um, and um, her book uh, published uh, two years ago, uh, sorry, three years ago now, um, um, uh, Donut Economics, How to Think Like a 21st Century Economist. And she makes it clear that that is all of us. Um, all you need to be an economist is a, a pencil to start trying to draw the world you want. And she has, um, in those seven principles, um, a very um, excellent guide, I think, um, to the main drivers of economics as we've been practicing them, and um, to economics as we need to practice. Um, so I think that's a, a very helpful one. If you want to delve deeper, uh, we go off into um, really interesting areas like new monetary systems and the rest. Um, but I, I, I won't disappear down that particular rabbit hole right now. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, donut economics, fantastic concept. And I, I guess most of us don't really consider that the field of economics is anything but financial a lot of the time. So that's certainly a, a very good um, shift in mindset. Um, I mean, our government's agencies do talk a lot, a fair bit about joined up systems and this idea of driving a, a just transition towards a low emissions world. Um, Mike, I wonder if you've got any uh, tangible examples of, of what that might look like on a systems change level to really embed concepts of, of regeneration. Yeah, thanks, Lena. Uh, just looking at John Malloy's comment there. Kia ora, John. Um, John's got some amazing ideas around, you know, how investors might want to start, you know, how we capture the imagination of investors in this space. Um, a couple of examples. Firstly, a real live one where you've got... Um, you know, I put the um, Iwi Māori group at the moment called Tuaropaki Trust that invested years ago in a geothermal power station. They had land, they had steam under the ground, and they did a joint venture with a power company and built a geothermal power station. Um, after a while uh, of successful operations of the power station, they realised that there was a whole lot of waste, heat and energy going to atmosphere, which is typical of all geothermal power stations. Um, but realise then that we'll ask the question, we've got all this heat going to atmosphere, what a waste. Imagine if we had hot houses and glass houses that could capture that heat and harness it. This is in central North Island where it's pretty cold during winter. Uh, so 20, hectare, 20 acres of glass houses later, they're exporting and uh, selling um, produce into local and export markets. Uh, and that's by utilising uh, heat and steam that was, as I said, um, previously going to atmosphere. And then a group of them realised further down the track that there was still um, heat going to atmosphere or going to waste. And so if they could capture that, what else could they do? And they built a, a milk processing plant which uses um, uh, waste heat, surplus heat from the geothermal power station to uh, drive the processing heat, uh, the heat process for the um, dry milk powder and UHF um, milk plant. The idea there is now you have this kind of circular um, mutually beneficial uh, commercial program that's running through, that's utilising energy that was previously not being utilised um, uh, in a way that was efficient for from a business standpoint, but also wasn't that helpful from or friendly from a um, greenhouse gas perspective. So they're using a lot of that energy internally to uh, build these businesses, which are hugely successful by global standards and highly competitive. Um, so that's one example where they've got at the heart of that uh, Kaitiakitanga's principles for what drives their strategies. They've got worm farms from waste from the milk factory being regenerated and, and processed on the um, land around the, um, these operations. Uh, and, and now have farmers that are starting to align with the regenerative agriculture movement in order to provide their supplier, which is the milk company, with um, cleaner food with a, low, a lower environmental footprint. That's one way. Another way, uh, uh, since post-COVID and during COVID, we had, there's a lot of conversation and narrative around the need to shorten our supply chains. And uh, one of the huge opportunities we've got in Aotearoa is, uh, and I mean, this again goes against the grain of the economies of scale model that we drove to shut down our local milk processes and move everything, you know, truck everything, uh, you know, 50 to 250 kilometres away to the milk factory um, to get economies of scale. Is 
tech is caught up now and stainless is caught up where the cost to build small plants, almost subscale and pilot plant size on the farm or close to the farm where a number of farmers can invest in downstream processing opportunities. How do you create a regenerative agriculture and a regenerative economic model and a regenerative food system uh, and, and, and shorten that supply chain so that we're better equipped for when the next pandemic hits or when COVID hits or when climate really starts to get disruptive. And one of those ways is to move that processing and that, that downstream stuff onto or closer to source or farm. And we know you can do that now. The cost to stand these plants up has become affordable for farmers to come together, for uh, the, the um, people who build these plants to come in, even as co-investors, and for outside investors to come in and partner uh, and build brands and put your distribution channels in place to get to market much more quickly than what you can at the moment. And so we know that these are um, now affordable, uh, profitable, in the US, we, uh, for every dollar that a consumer spends for produce off the shelf, about seven and a half cents of that makes its way back to the farmer. Under this regenerative economic model where farmers invest in downstream processing close to the gate, uh, we anticipate that by running regenerative on-farm practices that they get, that they're able to extract a lot more value out of that, kind of that dollar at the end uh, through uh, being able to prove that it's a healthier more sustainable product that they're sending to market. They should be able to benefit from that. Plus we know that they can get their input costs down and get a whole lot of other costs down at the same time. Plus the farmer should be able to have the opportunity to invest in downstream processing, kind of like they do with Fonterra and the big guys at the moment by holding shares, but they have much more say over the process and much more say over how they engage with the end consumer. And it's a much more, it's a much more intimate uh, economic model that the farmers locally can uh, can engage with. At the same time, they can have strategies in place where the first piece of the pie of produce that goes out the gate finds its way to the local communities before the rest goes off to the high value export or local markets that we know we can access. And there's about another hundred different examples, but um, I think it's the time has come where Dayman goes, we have to stop it. 100% agree. The cool thing is, as we speak right now, we can actually start doing things differently and better. We can't wait for government to catch up. Government will catch up, but we can't wait for that. We have to keep backing and supporting the people on the ground who are doing it, who want to keep doing it, and any new ones who are interested and want to come in and play this game where we're building short cycle regenerative food systems, starting on the, in the paddocks, ending up on the shelves or in the fridges, uh, and Back to John Malloy. I know John knows what uh, is, is one of the visionaries around this space. How do we get consumers buying into our infrastructure, our products, our goods, our services, because they love what we do now and we can prove that what we're doing is making an impact. Absolutely. Yeah, Hamish, you look like you wanted to add something there. I just wanted to add an example to what Mike's been talking about where we've shortened the supply chain. Um, the jersey that I'm wearing um, there's a bunch of farmers in, down in Otago that have invested in the whole supply chain and now we're getting our jerseys made and we sell them ourselves online. We're getting carpet made, we sell them direct. The point is we actually pay all the costs up front, which is quite significant. So we are the bank in, in essence, but the return for our jersey, our lambs will, which we get, through the market is $2 a kilo, $3 a kilo. We're actually returning $40 a kilo for these jerseys and the customer is getting good value. Like the, It's not an overinflated price, it's a fair price and the farmer's getting rewarded. And the carpet, we're returning $10 a kilo versus $1.50 a kilo. And the customer, again, is getting almost synthetic price value for top quality carpet. It, Mike, it absolutely can be done. It just takes a lot of effort because we've had a couple of um, really key guys that have driven it and have had the desire and the, the knowledge to be able to pull it together. So um, just an example on that one. It's a fantastic example. Where can, where can we find one of those shirts? What's the name it's of the just, company? <laughs> it's Agwool is the, is the company online, but that's not the point. The point is that it can be can be done and it's quite exciting to see the potential 
Um, but it is hard for farmers because we need more than just farmers to drive it because it's um, it takes a lot of time and energy initially. Well, I just just going to say to add to that. Um, I mean, people want to know what the examples are, but you know, Allbirds came out recently and announced to the world that they wanted to run a, um, a strategy that was supportive of regenerative agriculture. Now they buy their wool for their shoes out of New Zealand or Merino, and so you know that sends a. And then you've got Icebreaker. Um, you've got some amazing fashion brands, uh, Maggie Marilyn, you've got a whole bunch of New Zealand iconic brands, Cavalier just announced they're going all wool. Um, you know, the, these producers on the, uh, the, the, um, the producers on that side of the value chain are really sending a signal. They're listening to the consumer market that's saying to there's a, and at the moment it might be niche, but it's growing that this is what we want. This is what we're looking for. We expect this level of quality. We want to know that the, um, the products that we're buying off you, in this case wool, is wool that's coming from a place that is sustainable or regenerative, where the, the market's waking up and starting to understand this. And so I think what Hamish is saying, farmers are starting to come together to you know, build a more, product, a more profitable model inside. It doesn't have to be more highly productive or higher yield, it has to be more profitable for them. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, you've got these uh, labels, these fashion labels going, well, this is announcing to the world, this is the path we're going down. And then you've got NZ Marino and others who sit in the middle going, okay, well, we need to start making sure now that we can kind of meet both sides of that equation, which mm. a man on a call the other day, she gave me huge um, kind of faith in the universe and in the world because she is super optimistic about uh, our uh, medium long-term future because of some of the things she's seeing. And then it really made me think about going, you know, from a kind of a depressed state of, you know, this sixth mass, mass extinctions getting closer or whatever it is. Uh, then you actually think it, step back and think about it. And what Hamish just said, that farmers are coming together to do this. Um, the labels are coming together to do this. The guys in the middle are saying, okay, we need to get, we need to be able to make sure that we can meet this demand that's growing. And through all of this process, this is, I'll come back to this, is we need better policy to support this. But right now, it's policy that's going to have to catch up because we're seeing this amazing groundswell of demand, of supply demand playing out. At the moment, we, one of the things that we still need to solve is to get scaled finance into the sector because it's a key part of the infrastructure that hasn't quite caught up, but it's coming. Um, and, and it just gives me huge um, kind of faith and hope that there's a way out of this and New Zealand's going to lead the way. Thanks, Mike and Hamish. Um, maybe we'll just bounce back to you briefly, Hamish, um, with a question from Rosie Walford. What, um, on, the, on the back of that conversation, what, what do you think needs to happen before consumers can start to vote with their wallets, wallets and choose foods or goods that are regeneratively produced in Aotearoa? Do you need some sort of certification system or what do you see as the key levers to pull there? <laughs> right, I'll get to a controversial topic. We need <laughs> to forget about the debate between animals and plants. We need to start understanding on how our food is growing. So a huge focus goes on our dairy industry, but let's replace our dairy industry with growing vegetables. And vegetables are just as destructive to our land on 99% of the cases um, as well, it's more destructive than a dairy farm. We have to understand that our cows, our sheep, our ruminants are not the problem. The problem is how we manage them. So the ruminants aren't the ones piling on the nitrogen fertilizer. The ruminants aren't the ones plowing up our soils. The ruminants are just a wonderful tool to help us actually build topsoil with permanent pastures that can be done you know, for, for decades, for centuries. Um, our cropping and our vegetables, our horticulture have all got huge amounts of pesticides and chemicals that go into it. So we have to be very careful about understanding one versus the other. We have to understand on how and the way each system is, is farmed, is produced. Uh, to me, that's a key um, 
point I want to make. And the other thing is, yes, there's regenerative organic standards across the world now, or, or even a regenerative standard. And um, the Savory Institute has pulled that together. And I think we could just um, tie that into New Zealand, no problem. Uh, I, I don't think it's a major problem. Uh, it's, it'll be driven by our companies, our meat companies, our wool companies, our um, dairy companies wanting to drive it. And I think that's, and, and if, if enough of our uh, people who buy our food um, start to support the regenerative management and concepts, then these big companies, as Mike has said about um, all birds and icebreaker, et cetera, and Patagonia, et cetera, are being driven that way anyway. So I think if, if there was a label which um, that came out and it was supported, you would see just you would see change accelerate. Although I do feel change is going to take some decades. Sorry, but um, it, it, the transition, the change is hard. Um, I just want to stress that point. Um, while I get very very excited about the glimpses of brilliance I see, I also get um, it also can be quite a kick in the guts at times when things that you try don't work and that then goes under my experience um, column. And um, that can wear you down a bit, but, but where we see the wins and the, the progress, that's what keeps us going. And it keeps us going with other farmers now hopping on board and trying stuff and we're learning from each other. Um, we're bypassing um, so-called industry experts or scientists that think they've already got all the answers. We're just, we just carry on and then we start getting support from the likes of um, you guys, our panelists here and others in the urban setting and in policy. And once you start getting that, um, that big wave, uh, I think the, the customer can come in and start really supporting with what they buy. But at the moment it is a bit tough because there's only organic versus everything else. So uh, just give us time Give us all time and um, I'd say in the next five years, it, there'll be some big change. Wonderful. Yes, Rod, you wanted to add something. Um, yes, thank you very much indeed. Um, and I, Hamish, I agree with you um, all the way and I'd just like to add one more bit. Um, so yes to ruminant animals as a, a very important um, help in developing um, soil uh, carbon and fertility and building up soils. And of course, the nutrition is good too, in, in, uh, but in, in moderation, uh, whereas most of us Westerners are hugely overeating red meat, uh, we're not so badly off on dairy. But the crucial thing is though about uh, the uh, methane from those ruminant animals, because it is a very potent greenhouse gas, and it's a problem for ruminant animals worldwide. And the fact that um, we have a slight, a somewhat lower profile there doesn't um, let us off the hook. So the additional challenge um, through, um, first of all, far feed and farming practices, but then also breeding up herds around um, those um, animals which naturally have a lower methane profile to gradually keep reducing their methane. And we've been on that journey for over 25 years, reducing methane per litre of milk or per kilogram of milk solids by about 1% a year. And all we've got to do is to keep going on that rate. But we do need to be focused on that because at some point, particularly say when um, uh, tundra melt more and or hell breaks loose with a lot of methane emissions um, from the natural world, um, that w um, methane in farming and in uh, landfills and the rest uh, of, uh, of the byproducts of the way we do things is going to be a real issue. So yes to, I'm sorry to add one more to your do, to your to do list, <laughs> but I'd add, add methane too. You're a good point, Rod. Thank you. Um, Damien, what, what sort of learnings do you think we can see from, uh, from COVID-19? What, it's really tossed a mirror up in our faces, really. Um, so what, what, um, what do you think we can learn from our response to, to the virus to help form our thinking into a transition towards a regenerative economy? 
I'd like to I'd like to chip in a little bit more on trees and then and then answer that question if I may. Sure, uh, absolutely. Because we've been talking about shortening supply chains, and one of the things that I think you know already in New Zealand we have a lot of pine plantations, and we could be turning more of that timber into things like engineered wood, we, uh, timber for a building for um, it's good for you know it's useful for framing potentially for biofuels, but what we're doing at the moment in a, in a climate stressed world is taking, you know, very large quantities of logs, raw logs, and shipping them off to countries like China and India and South Korea. That is just not a viable strategy when you're thinking long term about sustainability and, and the kind of emissions involved in, in, in taking these vast, you know, very large logs and shipping them halfway around the world. So we did have nature-based forestry happening. The thing that would be great about that is we have some of the most beautiful timbers in the world in our forests, and they're unique, they're high value. And so instead of doing this kind of high volume, low value kind of production out of forestry, as we've been doing arguably also with things like white, you know, white powder and brown paper bags with dairying, to use more of our timber at source where, where it's useful, but also to be thinking much harder about how can we produce these beautiful, unique timbers with which, and in sustainably, in, in regenerative forests, ones which regenerate, they, they rely on regeneration, they don't have to be planted all the time, um, where the canopy is intact, where the, the birds have a home, uh, where you know, the, the rivers are, being, uh, are running clear again, and the ocean has a chance to, to uh, come back to life and where people can find pleasure and peace. Uh, I can just see this kind of series of, and this is what happened in COVID-19, to go to your question. You know, so many people turned for solace to places like the bush, to the beach, to the rivers. Uh, you know, they went on walks, they listened to the birds, they could hear them. <laughs> um, and, and I think in, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, we have that love anyway, but I think it was, it was magnified. In, and we also pride ourselves on being able to produce food. You know, we've, I come from a rural community. I've got, all my, I've got four brothers who are on the land doing very innovative things in viticulture and horticulture and farming. And if we could do that in such a way that we were leading the world, we, we're actually adapting ourselves to our islands. You know, we're learning how to live with our, our own indigenous forests and to use them creatively as Māori did in, in earlier times, you know, before a lot of them were burnt and the rest were locked up in conservation estate. But to use, use them wisely and to appreciate, because the timbers are gorgeous. Uh, my husband's an architect and, you know, instead of finishing with pine, it would be so beautiful to be able to finish with uh, Rewa Rewa and, uh, you know, beach and all these beautiful timbers. Uh, and we could export those and they would be very, very high value because they're unique in the world. So COVID, I think everybody wants, like people want hope on the horizon. They want something to look forward to. You know, the, I think all the scrapping and the kind of, uh, the grubby tactics, you know, that have been surrounding some of the early phases of the election are so out of touch with what people are feeling like at the moment. They don't want that. They want they want hope. They want to think about a better future for our country. They want to see a future for their children and grandchildren. Uh, in the farming community, they want to be able to see a future for their kids on the land in many cases. Uh, in our rural communities, they don't want to see them dying. And we can do this. We're, we're small enough as a, as a country. We're intimate enough with our leaders. You know, I think many of them, some of them don't listen, but many of them do. And if they don't listen, then, you know, we have recourse. Um, so, so it's a good idea for them to listen to good ideas at this point, I think. So that's what I think. I think COVID has focused our minds. It's given us time to think. It's given us some peace. It's given us a chance to reappreciate how gorgeous this country is. And to, to make, a, in many cases, a very fixed determination to look after it and to look after the future for our children and our grandchildren. Mm. Absolutely. You raise an interesting point there. We do have an election coming up in six weeks' time. Um, I would love to finish this webinar by asking each of our panellists, um, what, what would be the ideal uh, announcement from a political party that you would like to see 
around taking us towards a more regenerative economy within the next six weeks. In an uncertain world, when we've got much of the world still facing COVID-19, and we have an opportunity down here to start the rebuild, what, what would that uh, announcement look like from each of our panelists? So um, let's start with you, Mike. Uh, kia ora, Lena. What an awesome question to kind of wrap up with. Um, just following on from what Dayman said, really, um, you know, COVID, we showed, and thanks to the leadership of the government, you know, I go on the, my soapbox about how slow government is, and they need to keep up, and I, I, I'm not going to take that back. But at the same time, credit's where it's due. I mean, our government did an amazing job at um, keeping us informed to, in order to make the right decisions leading into COVID and during lockdown and, and after that, and have done an amazing job to secure the borders rightly or wrongly, you know, however long we can do that for um, is still a big question. But um, right now, we've got the luxury of, apart from the fact that visitors aren't able to um, come and enjoy our place en masse, which I'm kind of okay with right now, um, it's life, you know, life goes on. And I'm really with Damien. I think Aotearoa New Zealand has this amazing opportunity to firstly ourselves understand each other again, right back to what we start, what I started with, to understand more deeply about how, what drives us and what our aspirations are. And not that we necessarily need to agree on those, but let's just under, try and come from a better place of understanding understand that when we have to go follow the rule book and go into lockdown and protect ourselves, you know, iwi and Māori did it. We locked down roads and much of the certain media discussed, you know, they were protecting the elderly because no one else was going to come and protect them. That's a regenerative community happening, right? An economy happening right there. Look after your elders first and foremost, even if it means taking matters into your own hands. But we looked as a nation, we looked after ourselves. And now coming to election, we need to think about what looking after ourselves looks like into the distant, distant future. And we need to learn from the lessons of the past. We haven't got everything right. I mean, this is an amazing country. I could not imagine living anywhere else. Our culture, our, the diversity of our cultures, uh, the kind of the, the, the governance I bitch about, but I'm kind of okay with it. Um, we have a chance to show, demonstrate to ourselves first and then the world what a regenerative economy looks like. How do we give back more than what we take out? We don't need to extract, 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 drive, 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 just take it as much as we can in order to survive and thrive. We don't need to do that. We need to do the opposite. And I think we've made some really good gains in that. Um, I think post COVID, we run, into the, run the risk of um, the big important people when we sit around our big important board tables or our kind of our, our cabinet tables is forgetting about the idea that we have this opportunity right now to do things differently and better. We can talk about it, but we actually have to do it. And so I think the message to Wellington right now is we absolutely have, we've led the world in lockdown and coming out the other side. We need to now lead the world in what a new type of economy looks like globally, locally and globally. We need to show the world that looking after your local people first, in a world of, globe, of intensive globalization, that looking after your people first is actually a good thing, it's not a bad thing. And what that means is that we need to think about our own supply chains, our own production um, processes, our own di distribution and marketing strategies. And we can do that in a uniquely Aotearoa New Zealand way, um, embrace our diversity, our cultures, our Maori culture, our Pākehā culture, whatever culture it is, embrace that and take that to the world, but mean it this time. 100% pure New Zealand is not 100% pure. Yeah, but it can be. So mm. I don't know what the message is, Elena, but um, this government <laughs> get on the program in terms of let's work with that. They need to work with us and all our mates out there that are doing it right now, changing the game. Absolutely. Well said, Mike. Kia ora. Um, Hamish, what policy would you like to see announced or what message have you got for the government? Election. Um, I just want them to uh, to stop and seek to understand ecosystems, ecology, um, the, the, a whole approach to to all that we're doing, um, from the urban to the rural to the forestry areas. Um, you know, at, as a farm, we are so genuinely trying to farm to the future. And so the future for us is less fossil fuel, is less inputs. 
and that we just harvest solar energy in a way that our grazing management begins to grow, grow more grass or pasture, that we can be not just more uh, increase our biodiversity, our soil carbon, our water, but our profitability for our family and its succession. So if, if policymakers could understand the benefits of those strong um, communities on the land and what we can produce, it, it's, um, you, you can do it forever. As in manufacturing, things come and go, but food doesn't. Food is always there and we're so good at it. Um, please back our food producers um, uh, and understand the integration between all aspects of um, the different components that we deal with. So that's all I can say, really. Wonderful. Thank you, Hamish. Rod, over to you. Um, six weeks is a very short time to uh, substantially change the national conversation. Um, so I think the, there is a way that this can work, though. Um, so much about elections is very transactional. You know, uh, we're going to do this, which is going to benefit these people um, or, or, or this group or that need. Um, so if our politicians were saying we're going to do this, and here are some of the connections um, that play into this, uh, some of the additional benefits of it, um, and start to build up that sense of connection uh, across these issues. I think that would be um, a great help. They could actually go one stage further, which is we already have um, um, the uh, living standards uh, framework, and we've already had two budgets under that. That was actually work started by nationals, so it shouldn't be uh, language uh, foreign to them, um, because it starts to identify um, those, those wider effects, those wider connections. So just to start using rather different language, which sort of plays into this idea of regeneration, of reconnection. Um, and then um, once the election's over, um, uh, we can then start um, building on that national conversation. So people are more ready for the bigger policies um, and the bigger frameworks uh, that, uh, that we will need to um, help us on this journey. Thank you, Rod. And over to you, Dame Anne six weeks, what would you like to see? You're still on mute at the moment. Like, like Mike, um, what I think we learned about ourselves in, in lockdown, uh, we learned that when our leaders call to the best of us, we can rise to the challenge, you know, when, when, um, when we're thinking as a team of five million, we're thinking about all of us, we're thinking about the country, we're thinking about the city dwellers, we're thinking about Māori, we're thinking about other New Zealanders, we're thinking about women and men, uh, we're thinking about younger generation in the future. When we, when we come together and say, we've got this catastrophe facing us, we all just have to pull our weight uh, so that we can have a future, an immediate future, um, which is one where we're not plagued by this pan pandemic. We actually did it. Um, I don't, you know, I, I think it gave me huge faith in Kiwis and New Zealanders to realise that when that call comes out, we do respond. And I think the same thing is also true of post-election. You know, I think that um, when we're thinking about our leaders at the moment in politics, some of it's very tribal. And they get, you know, they get stuck in kind of, you know, policy positions that they've promoted somewhere else and so forth and so on and left versus right and this party likes this idea so the other party's going to fight against it even if it's a good one. In a way, in this context at the moment, that really does feel kind of a bit irrelevant and that's why I think many New Zealanders are just wishing the election was over and done with because it feels like it's, it's getting in the road uh, rather than helping us think about the sort of future that we want. So for me, the future that we could be looking towards is one which is based on interconnection. You know, we, we need leadership in our country which says, we're not gonna play these kind of dualistic games and say, well, you know, the farmers aren't gonna vote for us so we won't give them anything they want or, uh, you know, let's just look after the business community or whatever. It, this is just like in a small country like ours. Um, this is kind of 
fractured thinking. It's very divisive. It doesn't get us anywhere. It just ties us up in knots. And if we thought about the land that way too, as many of us did during COVID, you know, a lot of, a lot of people turned to their gardens. They started doing stuff again, like you know, baking and looking after, you know, looking after all the people in the neighborhood, dropping stuff off and uh, leaving it at the gate carefully and so on. The way people looked after each other in this country was really something else. And I saw that in our community. It was really inspiring. So it's not so much a single policy as a shift in, in, in the way people think about how to shape our future as a country I'd love to see. I'd really like to see people saying, you know, what is good for that team of five million? Um, you know, how can we shape our policy so that we really are delivering for this part of the community, for that, for the other, and not pitting it at us at each other's throats in order to try and win a few votes or something. Um, and if we could just, you know, run our political affairs much more like a family, you can squabble at times, but in the end, you know, uh, in the case of my large and rambunctious family, uh, we still really care for each other, uh, despite all the differences. And when it, when it really comes down to it, we pull together. That's the way I'd love to see it. So on the farm, in the cities, you know, in the, um, in, in the productive sectors, but also in the, in, the, in the halls of power, just be so fantastic to see that team of five million spirit carry through and, and allow us to plan for long-term futures, which are really uh, full of hope, full of promise, and where we look after our, our beautiful land. Couldn't agree with you more. That was very well said. Thank you, Damien. It does bring us to the close of our session and the close of this Our Regenerative Future series. Um, so I want to say a massive thank you to all our panellists this evening. Um, and, and on behalf of all the panellists that we've had over the last 12 weeks, our contributors, producers, um, it is all our collective hope that we can continue building on these cross-sector conversations to get people thinking about systems level strategies for regenerative and restorative economies going forward. Um, if you would like to find additional resources, these are available on the Pure Advantage campaign page for the Our Regenerative Future series. And you can also watch all the previous episodes um, of the series on that page. Um, a few thank yous to all the panelists that we've had throughout the entire series, all 33 of them, would you believe? Um, and to our media partner newsroom. Big thank you to uh, Paula Neme, Anse Cabral, and Yosef Ayili at EHF, as well as Ursula Griffin, and in particular, Simon Miller at Pure Advantage, who's been a fantastic um, person to be bouncing all of these ideas off along the way. I'm Alina Siegfried. Um, it's been a pleasure to have you along for the ride. Um, I myself am taking the next few months off to finish the book that I'm writing on storytelling and narrative to support systems change and addressing complex global issues like this. So you can learn more if you like and follow the progress of my book by heading along to onto my website at um, alinasigfried.com forward slash book. Um, we have certainly caught a glimpse, haven't we? Um, this COVID-19 thing has, has held a mirror up to us and, um, and nature really has called upon us to think differently and tell a new story of what our lives and our society and our economy could look like. So to close out, I'd love to leave you all with a final question that you can go away and think about over the next few weeks. And that is, what can you do? What can you personally do? to help contribute to making our lives and our economy in Aotearoa New Zealand inherently more regenerative in the future um, for the generations to come. Thank you all so much for tuning in. It's been fantastic to have you and I'm signing off. Ka kite. <laughs>